Okay, guys. So, yesterday, um, I introduced this idea of windows. So we were talking about a, just a different point of view on what Balenstein's theorem says. So the point was, you remember that we have this fairly straightforward thing, which is the equivariant derived category of uh, c to the n plus 1. And you can take sheaves in there, and you can restrict them to the complement of the origin. Uh, then you get something that lives on projective space. So there's a restriction functor from the equivariant category to uh, derived category of projective space. Um, and this category is quite a lot bigger than this category. So what we did is we defined a subcategory inside here, this window, by taking just the subcategory generated by this finite list of line bundles, and then Balenson's theorem says that this is an equivalence. Restriction gives you an equivalence from this subcategory to projective space. Um, and one way to think about this is you're trying to write down a sort of uh, an inverse, a right inverse to this restriction functor, a section of it. So you're trying to write down a functor that goes the other way and lifts it. And so that's what you get, because you can just invert this equivalence, right? And lift from this category up into this bigger category. Right? So that's the point of, point of windows. So the first thing I want to do today is do the same thing again for just a slightly more complicated example. And the example goes like this. So again, we're going to take C star and let it act on a vector space, which I'm going to call Cn plus 2. Um, and the weights of this action are not going to be just the standard diagonal action. We're going to change one of them. So we're going to have n plus 1 things which are weight 1. And then the last variable, I'm going to give weight minus d for some natural number d. Um, so what do I mean by the weight of the action of that? I just mean that if you take lambda in C star um, and let it act on a point which has coordinates x0 up to xn and the last coordinate, let's call it y, because it's behaving differently, that's going to get mapped to just lambda x0 up to lambda xn. But y gets multiplied by lambda to the minus d. OK? So that's a, that's a C star action on this space, but it's not the, not the standard just diagonal dilation one. It's a slightly different one. Um, and as before, you can just think of this as a grading on the ring of polynomials. So if you let R be the polynomial ring in these variables, What we've done is we've given that a grading, but not the standard grading where all the variables have grade 1, but a grading with these grades. So there are some things in positive grade, and there are some things in negative grade. OK, so that's the equivariant thing. And now we want to form the quotient space. So when you build projective space, all you do is you throw away the origin. So it turns out in this situation, for reasons I, I guess I won't go into, uh, it's better not just to throw away the origin, but to throw away a bit more. So what you want to throw away is uh, the whole line of the points where the x coordinates are 0. So let's think about deleting the set where all the x coordinates are 0, which is just 
a single line with a y coordinate. And then I form equation space x by taking the quotient of the remainder. So I get cn plus 2, I delete this single line, and I quotient by the action c star. OK, this gives us a nice, well-behaved algebraic variety, but what is it? What is this space that we've just constructed? So to understand that, you have to think about the map that you have, which projects off the y-coordinate. Right? So if I give you a point with x and y-coordinates, and I just forget the y-coordinate, then I have just x's, and the x's cannot be 0 because I've deleted this line, and I mod out by rescaling. So I'm landing in projective space. So this x that I've just built evidently comes with a map to pn, where the pn is in the x coordinates. OK? And now we should ask, what are the fibers of this map? So you fix the x coordinates, then the freedom you have is to just choose the value of y. Right? And y can be anything. Right? Y can be any number. It couldn't even be 0, because I don't care about y going to 0. I just deleted this locus here. So the fibers of this map are lines. So if you look at it a little bit more carefully, you realize that it is actually a line bundle, which is what you'd expect. If the fibers are lines, it's probably a line bundle. It is a line bundle. Um, and then you just have to ask the question, which line bundle is it? And of course, it's obvious which one it is. It's the line bundle O minus D. Ah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So x is the total space of the line bundle O minus D sitting over projective space. And y is like a coordinate on the fiber. y tells you how far up the fiber you are away from the zero locus. Um, that was a little bit sketchy. And um, some of you will, will be totally happy and think that's totally obvious that that x is that, and some of you might need to think about it a little bit more. Um, I set it as an exercise on the sheet yesterday to check that that's a little bit more, check that a little bit more carefully, at least in the case n equals 1. OK. Yeah. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah, that's right. Y is, yeah, exactly. The, the x's are not functions on pn, right? They're projective coordinates. Y is not a function either. But it, nevertheless, it is like, it does tell you how far up the five you are. When you're at y equals 0, you're on the 0 section, right? Um, OK, so this is a little bit different because it's non-compact. Well, I guess, strictly speaking, I should say it's not proper. So things are going to behave uh, just you know, slightly differently from, from the way they did before, but not very differently. So we still, bef exactly as we did in the, in the previous example, we have a restriction functor, which takes us from the equivariant derived category. You restrict to, to this open set here, and now you land on, in the derived category of x. Okay, equivariant sheaves on this open set here are the same thing as sheaves on X. Okay, so again, this functor is not an equivalence. Right? The equivariant category is bigger, and we want to do the same game that we did before, trying to find a subcategory inside it which is equivalent to dBx. 
So we need to do what we did before and check what changes, what morphisms change when you apply this functor. So we need to check how homs and exts change under applying this functor row star. So on the equivariant derived category, just as before, things are pretty straightforward. Sheaves don't have any cohomology, right? So the same argument as before. Taking global sections in the equivariant derived category means taking invariants. That's an exact functor. So there's no higher cohomology. So on this guy, if I was to compute the X groups between two of my standard line bundles. So these, again, these are just like, in terms of modules, these are just the free graded modules with some shift in the grading. They define line bundles, if you want to think geometrically. They define equivariant line bundles on CN plus 2. Um, and this X group is 0 if K is positive. There is no higher cohomology. Um, but if k is 0, you're just getting the equivariant homs from there to there, which means that you're getting the graded pieces of the ring R. Um, now, something to note that was different from the original example is that this ring is graded in positive and negative degrees. So these graded pieces are never zero. And moreover, all of them are infinite dimensional. Right? Even R0, the degree zero piece, is infinite dimensional. Because if you think about combining things, some pump copies of x's with some number of copies of y, it's easy to build things which have degree zero. There are lots of them. So note that every graded piece, Rj minus i, is infinite dimensional. Um, and this is a kind of a non-compactness thing. Right? Projector space is compact, and that's kind of reflected in the fact that the, uh, the ring R0 is, is just a point. Here, because we're non-compact, even the ring R0 is, is a big, interesting ring already. Um, I say what R0, maybe this is a good time to say what R0 is in passing. So R0, well, how do I build something of degree 0? Well, I could take something here which has um, degree d, so a degree d polynomial in the x's, and multiply it by y, and then it would have degree 0. Or I could take something which was degree 2d and multiply it by y squared, or anything like that. All right, so R0 is... Um, spanned by things which are polynomials in x times uh, y to the t, where p is a polynomial of degree d times t. And you can figure out what all the other graded pieces are as well. Um, now, what if I restrict to x, and I try and do the same computation? What are these x groups going to be? So on x, if I want to know an x group between two line bundles, well, that's just the cohomology on x of the line bundle O, J minus I. And now the best way to compute this is to use this map pi, this projection map that you have for the vector bundle. So I was going to go through this calculation in detail, but I've, I can't be bothered. So I'm just going to tell you the answer, I think.
So computing this cohomology group, it turns out, is the same as computing a cohomology group on projective space of the sheaf you get by pushing down this line bundle. As you take the line bundle on the total space and you push it down and you get a sheaf on projective space. And it's not a coherent sheaf now, it's a quasi-coherent sheaf. It's infinite rank and this is what it is. So it's an infinite number of copies of line bundles uh, starting with the line bundle OJ minus I and then you have to add on D you have this line bundle of higher degree, and then you have to add on 2D, and then you have to do that for all positive multiples of D. Um, if it's not clear to you why that is the answer, then I think view this as, an, as a bonus exercise. Ask one of your neighbors, see if they know why it's true. Or come and ask me if you can't figure that out. Okay, so in particular, in degree zero, If we just want to know about the homs between OI and OJ, what are you getting? You're just getting the sections, right? Set k equals zero, you're just computing the sections of all of these guys. So you're getting polynomials in X. Let me put it another way. Polynomials in X of degree J minus I. plus polynomials in X of this degree, degree J minus I plus D, plus polynomials of degree J minus I plus 2D, and so forth. Right? So it's this infinite string of polynomials of increasing degree where the degree is jumping up by D every time. Um, and if you stare at it hard enough, you can convince yourself that this is exactly the same thing as the graded pieces of the ring R. Right? These higher, these higher uh, terms, think of them as being multiplied by powers of y. Polynomials in x times y, polynomials in x times y squared, and so forth, and it comes out exactly the same. Um, now, we didn't really need to do all of that, um, because we could actually have just applied um, Hartog's theorem. So what we've done is we've computed the cohomology, the sorry, the sections of a line bundle, just H0 of a line bundle. And first of all, we've done it on the whole vector space. And secondly, we've done it on this open set inside this set vector space. But the thing that we deleted had high codimension, right? It had codimension bigger than one. And when you do that, the sections of a line bundle don't change, right? So in fact, from that point of view, this was a waste of time. So H0 on Cn plus 2 of Oj minus I has to be equal to H0 on X Oj minus I by the Riemann extension theorem or by Hartog's theorem. Um, but for the higher cohomology, that, that argument doesn't work. The cohomology certainly could change. Um, so it wasn't actually a waste of time. Um, so let's look at the higher cohomology instead. And the key point to notice is that these line bundles are increasing in degree. So the only way you can get higher cohomology is if you started with something that had higher cohomology. So if this is, is really negative, then the very first thing there has, has some Hn, 
and then maybe some of the others have HN for a while. But if the thing you started with is not very negative and it has no HN, then none of the others have HN either. Right? So if J minus I is at least minus N, then the higher cohomology um, of this line bundle, O J minus I, is zero. Okay? So no etch to X groups show up. Right, so this is exactly the kind of calculation we were doing in the previous example for projective space. We were saying, if you, if you take two line bundles, then, and you restrict to the open set, when does the cohomology change? And the X zeros, the, the, the H zero of the line bundle, do, is never gonna change, just because you you, all you've done is thrown away a, a low co-dimensional piece. But the higher cohomology could change, but sometimes it doesn't, right? If you make sure that this number is not too negative, then you don't pick up any higher cohomology and, and you're okay, right? So what does this say? It says that we should do the following. It says that we should define our window in exactly the same way. So some subcategory inside the equivariant derived category and we should take exactly the same set of line bundles that we did before and then if i look at the x groups between any two of these guys i'll be computing this quantity here and j minus i will always satisfy this lower bound so the X groups will not change when I restrict to X. So this restriction functor from the window to dBx is fully faithful. Right? It's exactly the same situation as we had in the projective space example. So the other half of it, the other claim was about, um, was about essential surjectivity. Um, so the next thing we want to know is that if I take only these line bundles here, look at them on X, do they generate the whole derived category? That's the statement that W is essentially surjective. Um, and I think I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do that because there's some little slightly delicate bits that I can't, I don't really want to go into. So also, this set of line bundles generate the derived category of x. Let me just remark this is a slightly delicate thing to prove, but it does, it is true. So this restriction functor is essentially subjective. Um, okay, so we've just basically just replicated what we did for projective space for this slightly more interesting thing, this non-compact guy, this total space of a line bundle over projective space. Um, so the W is equivalent to the derived category of X. And again, it's crucial that we take exactly this set of line bundles if we took any fewer, they wouldn't generate the derived category anymore. And if we took any more, we wouldn't have this fully faithfulness, right? As soon as you let in O n plus one, then suddenly you discover that this term here has some higher cohomology and suddenly your functor's not fully faithful anymore, right? Exactly as, as we had before. Okay, so let me just make um, one quick remark on, on the geometry because it's going to come back and, and be useful later. Um, this space that we built, X, if you look at the ring of functions on it, 
that's a non-trivial thing, right? It's the, it's the ring R0 over there. So that says that the affinization of this space is, is something non-trivial, not just the point. So any, any scheme has a map to its affinization, which is spec of the global ring of functions on this guy. And for us, this is the ring R0, the invariance. And I just want to remark on another way to think about what that ring is. So it's polynomials in X whose degrees are multiples of D. So another way to say this is that I take all polynomials in X and I act on them by a cyclic group of order D. Just by, so I pick a primitive dth root of unity and I multiply every, every coordinate by that primitive root. And then when are you invariant? You're invariant if you're a polynomial of degree, which is a multiple of d. Right? So this ring is this ring of invariants. So this affinization, spec of R0, is the quotient space Cn. Uh, sorry, Cn plus 1 modulo the finite group Zd. So it's a singularity. It's a quotient singularity. You take Cn plus 1, you fold it up on itself by this action. You build yourself some sort of singularity like that. And we have a map to this singularity from x. And x itself is a smooth space. And it's clear that it's an isomorphism away from of the singularity. So this is a resolution of singularities. So x resolves this singularity. OK. Cool. Right, that was everything I wanted to say about this example for the time being. I will come back. I want to move on to a more interesting example. In fact, what I want to move on to is the most interesting example which is the Atiyah flop. So this is, this is really, like, if you haven't, probably many of you have looked at Atiyah flops, the standard, also called the standard flop. Probably many of you have looked at this in, in the past in some various contexts. Um, this is really one of the foundational examples in algebraic geometry. It, I am embarrassed how many papers I have written which are just on this one simple example. But it is just so rich. There's so many different stories you can tell about it. Anyway, let me, let me build it for you. So we start in a similar way. We, we let C star act on a vector space. And now the vector space is just going to be C4. And I have to tell you the weights of the action. So I'm going to have two things which are weight 1 and two things which are weight minus 1. OK, so it's a little bit more complicated than before, where we had all weights 1 except the last one. Now we have 2, two of plus 1, 2 of minus 1. Um, and let me give the coordinates names. So let's say I have x1 and x2 and y1 and y2. OK? So again, it's just a graded ring with a Funny grading on it. Um, and to form a nice quotient space, we have to throw something away. Um, and we do basically what we did before, which is to throw away the locus where the x coordinates go to 0. Right? So let me form a space, which I'm going to call x plus, which is given by taking c4 and deleting the set where both x coordinates go to 0. OK? So what space have we just built? Well, we do the same thing that we did before. We think about projecting off the y coordinates. So again, I'm going to have a map pi, probably I should call it pi plus, um, which is going to go from x plus down to the projective space built by the x coordinates. 
So that's a copy of P1 with projective coordinates given by the x variables. And again, this is a vector bundle, right? The fibers of this map are just copies of C2, because you can set the y coordinates to be whatever you like. Right? So if you believe me that the previous example was a, was a line bundle, then hopefully you believe me that this is a rank two vector bundle. And hopefully you can see what it is. It's the total space of O minus one twice. So the direct sum of two copies of O minus one on P1. So we can do everything that we just did before. Um, you know, have to know how to modify this answer here. But if you understood how I got this answer, then you will understand how to modify it. And if you didn't understand, then you probably don't care. So um, you can just run everything that we did before in exactly the same way. And it leads you to the same conclusion. You should define a window subcategory generated by O and O1 inside the derived category of C4, the equivariant derived category of C4. And all the same arguments that we had before tell us that this window, W, is equivalent to the derived category of X plus. So I have a restriction functor, which I'm going to call rho plus, which is going from this equivariant derived category and restricting to the open set that defined x. And if you look at this functor, but only on the subcategory w, it's an equivalence. OK, great. So we're just telling the same story again for a, a slightly different example. Except that now, you look at this example, and you see there's a really obvious symmetry between the x variables and the y variables, at least up to swapping 1 and minus 1 over. So basically, why on earth did I throw away the locus where the x coordinates went to 0 instead of throwing away the locus where the y coordinates went to 0? Right? You have that choice. Uh, this, is, this is what I meant when I said in the first lecture, sometimes you have a choice about what you do when you form the quotient. Projective space, you kind of have no choice. You just throw away the origin. That's kind of the only thing you can do. Here, there are two possibilities. So here is the other choice, and here is why all the pluses were in there. Let's let x minus be c4 take away the locus where the y coordinates go to 0. And what do you get? Well, by the symmetry of it, you basically get the same thing again, um, except that it doesn't now live over the same P1. It lives over a different P1. So it's the total space of O minus 1 squared, the O minus 1 direct sum itself, um, over P1, except that the P1 is now the P1 in the y coordinates instead of the x coordinates. So geometrically, the role of the x coordinates and the y coordinates are swapped. In x plus, the x coordinates are the coordinates on the base P1, and the y's are the fiber coordinates. They tell you how far you how far you up in the in the two fibers. Um, in x minus, the two things get swapped in their places. Well, it, it kind of is, right? Minus 1 is, I mean, I'm, I'll mutter uh, something about that in a second. But minus 1 kind of is swapped with, with plus 1. Do you mean why is this minus 1 and not plus 1? Um, because this, yeah, right? If you, if, one way to do it is to say this projective space is built using variables which have weight minus 1 instead of weight plus 1. 
if you say that, if you're happy that projective space could be built with variables that had weight minus one, then you'd be correct, this would be plus one. But if you want to think of this as the ordinary version of projective space, then you have to flip the y variables to be weight plus one, and the x variables to be weight minus one, and then it becomes that again, right? There is an annoying, this is just an annoying thing about signs, and if you work through my exercises, you will get confused about these signs. I, I did when I was writing them. <laughs> The elegant solution is, is, is to allow the y's to be, to be negative throughout, but it's a little bit confusing. Um, yeah, so let me, so what, what I've just described, these two spaces, these are the Atiyah flop, right? This is, what, this is what we're doing. So x plus and x minus are both, are birational to each other. And they're three-dimensional, so they're birational threefolds. Right? So if you're not an algebraic geometer, the point is a birational space is when you take out a, a small locus and modify it and put it back in again or something, and you get a space which is almost the same as the previous one. It's just been modified in a little region. Right? And that's what's happened. X plus and X minus, they're exactly the same apart from on the zero loci. Right? If I cut out where the y's are zero and I cut out where the x's are zero, then these two spaces are exactly the same. So this is a big Zariski open set where the two spaces are isomorphic, and the only difference is, is whether you glued in the, the p1 of the x's or you glue in the p1 of the y's. Those are your choices. Right, so you're, you're doing this switch from having a p1 that goes there and switching it to having a different p1 going there. But away from the p1, you haven't done anything. Um, so it's called the Atiyah flop, or the standard flop, and it is, yeah, like the most important example in all of mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that's a very good question. They are isomorphic, yeah? They are isomorphic, but um, that's a fact that you should ignore, okay? It's a sort of a coincidence that they're isomorphic. They're not isomorphic in any, any, any way that's helpful. So let me, let me just say that. Say that again? Yes. Definitely not over P1, and not even over their affinizations, they're not isomorphic. Okay? Uh, so X1 is isomorphic to X minus, but this is, this is a misleading fact. Um, Really, the point is, uh, I, all I'm showing you is a sort of a toy model, a local model for a, for a more general phenomenon. What you should really imagine is you have some big threefold, so maybe if it's even compact, projective threefold, and sitting inside it, you have found a copy of P1 whose normal bundle is O minus one plus O minus one. Right? And then in this little region, you, all you've done is you've taken that P1 and you've done this transition, this flop, and turned it into this different P1, but you haven't changed the rest of the space at all. Right? So that's something that you can do if, if you know a bit more geometry. Um, and then the two spaces will be genuinely be different. Right? They only happen to be isomorphic in this tiny little region, but as soon as you've got anything else going on, they stop being isomorphic. So the point is, this is just a local model uh, for a, a more general construction. OK, so that's the geometry. Now what about the categories? Well, I argue that if you take this window, generated by O and O1, it's going to be equivalent to dBx plus. But I could have used the same argument to say it's equivalent to dBx minus. So 
So if I take this exact same category, O and O1, and I restrict it to the open set defining x minus, it's going to give you an equivalence to dbx minus. So what have we constructed? We've constructed a derived equivalence between two different spaces. And that was something that I promised you yesterday. Two, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't look very impressive because x plus and x minus are isomorphic. But you have to believe me that that's, an, <laughs> that's a distraction. They genuinely, they are actually different. Um, but they have exactly the same derived categories, right? And in particular, if you go into this global situation, you say, okay, I have some big space x plus, and I do this little flop, and I produce a different space x minus, the x plus and x minus will still be derived equivalent, right? The derived equivalence is genuine. It's something that actually makes sense locally. Um, they are equivalent relative to their affinizations, um, whereas the isomorphism is ju just a silly fluke, right? And in particular, if you picked an isomorphism, if you say, well, I'm just going to choose myself an isomorphism between x plus and x minus, which you can do, then you'll get an equivalence between the derived categories, for sure, because they're isomorphic, but it will not be the same thing that we just produced, right? You will not discover that this thing is then just the identity, right? It's genuinely different. There are many, many, many such examples. I don't want to do them now because they're a bit complicated. I will do an example. Is something common? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a crazy No, no. It's extremely common. It was something that people realized when they first started studying threefolds that this kind of behavior is very common. The fact that you find the same thing on each side is, is very uncommon, exactly. As I'm saying, it's a freak coincidence. It's an artifact of the fact that I'm showing you the simplest possible local model. Um, I can show you global models, but not live at the board. <laughs> but I will, show you, I will show you an example where they're genuinely different, probably tomorrow. Um, Yeah, what are other remarks did I want to mutter? Um, oh, yeah, let me come back to this issue about signs, which, which we already tripped over once. Um, so when we form x minus, then in some sense, you also have to flip, flip the signs of the weights. Right, if you, want, if you want this P1 to be the familiar normal version of P1, you have to declare that they have weights 1 and the x's have weights minus 1, okay? Um, and when you come to doing computations, that has an important effect that if you start with OK on CN, uh, sorry, on C4, and you restrict it, to x minus, then you don't get the line bundle OK, you get the line bundle O minus K. All right, that, is not, that is not meant to be an interesting phenomenon, it's just a question of how you keep track of your signs. But it is something that can easily trip you up doing computations. Um, and in fact, that, that's something that we've, we've skipped over a, a tiny bit here, because I said that this window is going to be equivalent to that by the same arguments. But if you flip the signs, then it doesn't look like exactly the same window. Instead of having O and O1 in it, it has O and O minus 1 in it, OK? So from the x minus point of view, the window that we just defined is actually generated by O and O minus 1. 
Okay? But that's fine because, as we saw yesterday, you, you don't have to choose O and O1. You can choose any pair of adjacent line bundles. You can choose OK and OK plus 1. So this is just another possible choice. I'm choosing O minus 1 and O. Okay? So it's just that from the two different sides, it looks like you've made two different choices. That's all right. Um, but on, once you realize that, you, you realize that actually this construction has, has some flexibility in it because I don't have to choose this particular window. I could choose one of those other ones. Right? I could choose OK and OK plus 1 instead. And then I'll get myself a derived equivalence between x plus and x minus. Right? So you lift up into this window in the equivariant category, and then you restrict down again, and both arrows are equivalences, so you get a derived equivalence from there to there. And the interesting fact is that the equivalence that you get along the bottom depends on k. So this choice, well, the functor that you get depends on which window you chose. So we're getting a nicer statement. We're not just saying these two things are derived equivalent. We're actually saying I know loads of derived equivalences between them, and they're all different. So I set you an exercise on yesterday's sheet to check that I say that what I said here is true. It really does depend on k. And the nice consequence of that, which I also put in the exercise, is that you now have a choice to go across one equivalence and back through a different equivalence. And if you do that, you get an auto-equivalence of this category. So an isomorphism, an equivalence of this category to itself, which is not the identity. Right? So you get a symmetry of this category. So suddenly, from, the, from this construction, we suddenly discover something just about x plus itself, which is this derived category has some interesting symmetries coming from going over to the other model and coming back again. All right? So I set you an exercise which more or less is to compute what those symmetries are explicitly. So the, the study of symmetry groups of derived categories is a very interesting subject that um, is very far from understood. I mean, people write papers where they just like, you know, prove what the symmetry of the derived category of P2 is, prove what the symmetry group is. Right, but for complicated things, we have no idea what the symmetry group is. Sure. Hmm? No. Yeah, no, they don't. This is very much not to do with the Belian categories, right? I said that was one of the exercises on the sheet, which is that if you try and play this game for abelian categories, it goes wrong instantly. These functors do not respect coherent sheaves. They don't send sheaves to sheaves. Right? And they ju so they don't respect the, the coherent sheaves inside them. They also don't respect the tensor product, which is feel, I want to say that's kind of a related thing, but I don't know if I could back that statement up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, all equivalences are given by kernels, but, you know, Explicitly. Is that a problem? Uh, you, you mean that, like, there are some theorems in the literature that say if it's projective, then it's given by a kernel or something? Is that your? Okay, but it's just true. All, all funct. Let me. Okay, all functors are given by kernels. If you want a functor that's not given by a kernel, you have to construct some insane pathology. I mean. Oh, I see. I, uh, yeah, that's true, I guess. Yeah. No, no, I'm not doing it. No. I'm doing other things. Yeah, by all, work it out. Good exercise. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK, that's true. Yeah, yeah I was going to do that next. That's true. I guess that gives you the kernel. But no, I thought you meant of the sphere. I thought you meant of the, the auto equivalence, which is different.
The correct definition of a functor between two derived categories is a Fourier Mackay kernel, right? That is the correct, that is the definition of a functor. Everything else is messing around. Oh yeah, that, the next thing in my notes is to say what Nick just said. It doesn't say, say what Nick just said. It says, <laughs> Right. Um, okay, so let, yeah, let me just tell you a little bit more about the geometry of the situation. Um, so, as I pointed out in the last example, because these guys are non-compact, um, they have an interesting map to their affinizations. So if you look at the ring of functions on them, those, those are the degree zero polynomials when I use this grading. That gives me a ring, and I can take spec of that ring, and this is some affine thing. Um, I'll tell you what the ring is. Uh, it's a polynomial ring in, in four generators modulo the relation AD minus BC, uh, which I guess is an expression you may have come across before in mathematics. Um, uh, so this is a singularity, um, which is very important. It's called a threefold ordinary double point. Um, and x plus and x minus are birational. They're exactly the same apart from in some co-dimension two piece. So x minus maps to exactly the same affine base. Um, so each of them is a resolution of singularities. Aha, I've made an error in my board work. And what, I, what the thing that we were muttering about, to what extent are these things isomorphic, the point is, it's true that these are isomorphic, but you cannot find an isomorphism that fills this into a commuting triangle, right? They are not isomorphic relative to this base. The isomorphism messes up these maps, right? So that's why, it's, that's why you should ignore it. If they were isomorphic over this base, then they would be genuinely the same. Um, and there is another space which you can fit into this, into this picture, uh, which ideally fits about here on the board, which was my mistake. I'll put it up there. So it's called the roof, the birational roof of this singularity. Um, and the way you get it is you either take x plus and perform a blow up along the zero section, Right, so x plus is this vector bundle. It has this um, co-dimension two rational curve sitting inside it. I can blow up that rational curve, and I'll get some bigger space. So x plus is the blow up along the P1 of x plus. Um, or what's nice is that it's, the situation is completely symmetric. You could instead take x minus and do the same procedure, blow up the zero locus, and you get exactly the same spaces. Uh, genuinely the same, not coincidentally the same, actually the same. Um, and another way to say what it is, it's the total space of a line bundle on P1 cross P1. Um, that fact may not be instantly obvious, but um, if you think hard about what blowing up this P1 is going to do, you can kind of see that the exceptional locus is going to be P1 cross P1, and then you just need one extra dimension after that, right? It's going to be a threefold with a P1 cross P1 in it, so it's not so surprising that you get this answer. And if you stare at it hard enough, you can convince yourself that I'm right. It is that answer. Um, and so now we have another way, this is what Nick said, another way to get from x plus to x minus, which is to go up, to pull up our sheaves to x tilde, and then push them down again. Okay, that's a nice fourier mackay kind of a thing to do. Um, and it turns out that that operation is also a derived equivalence, and it's exactly the same as the derived equivalence that we just constructed using Windows. And that's actually, that's actually how it was at first discovered that these things are derived equivalent.
So the original theorem here is, is due to Bondal and, and Orloff. And it says that if you take sheaves up to x tilde, pull them up to x tilde, and then push them down again, you get a functor from x plus to x minus, and it's an equivalence. OK, and that proof is, is completely different. Um, has nothing to do with windows or equivariance or anything. It's, it's to do with looking at the, the effect of this functor on skyscraper sheaves at points. Um, I'm not going to tell you how that proof goes. Um, but what I do want you to investigate is, is the fact that this equivalence here is the same as the one that we constructed. So this is the same functor as our one that we built using this window, this particular choice of window. OK, that's an exercise. So to do the exercise, you just check what the bundle all of functor does to these line bundles, and you make sure it's the same as the thing that our functor did. And then for bonus points, you check it on the morphisms as well, and then you're done. All right, so it's not an abstract proof. You just check, check what these two functors do and see if they do the same thing. Okay. Um, I'm nearly at the end. Um, there's, another, there's another proof of this fact that it's the same functor, which is kind of fun. Um, and it's fun because it involves a higher rank quotient. So we've just been doing C star acting on a vector space. Um, if, you're, if you're allowed to take C star squared acting on a vector space, then you can build, a, build an example which incorporates x plus and x minus and x tilde all together, and then you can use that example to, to prove this result. Um, and I might do that on Thursday. I haven't decided. There's another proof I might do later. Probably not, which is why I'm bothering to tell you about it now. But, um, yeah, I guess I should probably stop. The next thing, which we will do on Thursday, is to generalize this example um, just a little bit and see some cases where the two spaces are genuinely different, not isomorphic in any sense. And moreover, they're not derived equivalent exactly, right? But rather, you get that the two derived categories are related by a semi-orthogonal decomposition. So you see one of them inside the other, but you don't see exactly the same. So that's a little bit more interesting. OK, thanks. <laughs>